Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Thera. I am the Executive Director of Education and Engagement for BC's Office of the Human Rights Commissioner. Welcome to our Facebook Live session this morning, where you get a chance to chat with uh, elders and the commissioner. We're very, very excited to host this event, and we're really happy that uh, you're joining us from across the province. We know there are a number of people who have signed up to join us, and, and uh, we are really excited to be able to uh, come to you today. I am in uh, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam territory this morning, and the sun is shining brightly uh, in my room. Uh, I'm really uh, very happy to see the sun today because it, um, uh, it reminds me that we all are connected through, through the light that shines on us, regardless of where we are in the province. And I was also really happy to see our elder Barb uh, wearing yellow today to mimic the sun. Um, uh, I'd like you to um, uh, take a moment and uh, familiarize yourself with the Facebook Live event. You can see where you can make comments. We've got a team that's working with us to receive your comments and they will respond. And then also we can respond live on the air as we proceed. But from here, I want to introduce you to our elders who will be joining us in the in our chat this morning with the commissioner. Um, in the north, we've got Barb Ward Burkett, who is a grandmother of five, and she's raising five grandchildren. And she was telling me yesterday how proud she is of that um, achievement. Um, Barb also is the chair of the Minister's Advisory Council for of Indigenous Women, and she is also the executive director of the Prince George Friendship Center. So um, I, when we were talking about this chat as the kitchen table chat, I, I said to her that she was bringing the kitchen sink with her as well because she does everything. So welcome, Barb. And I also want to introduce you to Uncle Shane, Shane Point, who is our elder from Musqueam. And he is in the south of the province and he is joining us here this morning from Musqueam territory. So I just want to open the floor for um, Barb and Shane to welcome us to the province. Ladies first, Barb. Thank you so much, Uncle Shane. Uh, Danse Nia Wahiok Wapdasko Sagaswian. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my traditional name is Wahiok Wapdasko, uh, and uh, that translates from Cree into English as Seas Far Woman. I'm uh, really happy to be joining you this morning from the unceded ancestral territory of the Tlaitli Tene. Uh, under the leadership of Chief Clayton Pountney, as well as his counselors, Helen uh, Buskus, Dolene Logan, Josh Seymour, and Clarence John. And I'm also thinking of the elders. There are only five fluent speaking elders that are in that community that speak um, this specific dialect of carrier. And so I'm really thinking of them uh, today as the nation goes through the election process and uh, thinking of the elders and how they're guiding that process and their good orderly direction. And uh, I'm thinking of the medicine that comes um, from uh, that nation and uh, the medicine of their language, the medicine of their culture, the medicine of their traditions, and uh, thinking of that medicine as it guides the work that I do here at the Friendship Center in this territory, but uh, guides the work of the nation as well. So um, I want to acknowledge them and uh, just acknowledge everybody that's uh, a part of this, this event today. And uh, just, you know, thinking about the territories that everybody is joining us from and uh, thinking about each and every one of you and hope that um, you're all doing well and, um, just uh, I'm very, very happy and honored to uh, be a part of this event and especially honored to uh, join uh, and be a part of this process with, with Shane, with Uncle Shane. I've known him for a long, long time and just have a ton of respect for you, Shane. So um, with that, Uncle Shane, I'll turn it over to you, to all my relations. Thank, thank you very much, Barb. 
I want to say to all of you that I welcome you to this moment and to this time in this space. I want to welcome you on behalf of my elected leadership here at Musqueam. The children of Musqueam and their parents as well and their peers throughout the province of British Columbia. I'm happy that we get to Zoom mm -hmm. because we get to reach so many more people and people get to participate. I know that I've been to conferences in the past and not many people have been able to come with this new way of being, we get to reach more people. We get to hear more, see more and feel more. So I'm happy to be here today to be with all of you. It's a great honor and a privilege, of course, for me to, to be invited to participate in such discussions. I'm happy to see Barb as well. I haven't seen her in a while. She's someone that I admire greatly and I admire and respect the work that she's done over her time as well as Sharon Thera. Grateful to be here. I look forward to hearing the words that the respected person has to say today about human rights. So once more, I welcome all of you to this time and this place, to this moment, to engage in a very important question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Uncle Shane and to Barb for being with us here today. Um, as well, we have in the session, Commissioner Kasari Govinder, who in the time that I've known her, uh, has demonstrated a real commitment to um, somebody that uh, Shane mentioned and Barb mentioned, and that is children, because she's interested in the way that our society will evolve in the future and the kind of world that we leave for our children. So I want to thank you both for mentioning the children, because I know that uh, that's dear to Kasari's heart. Uh, and as well, we will have our engagement team joining us when we get to the question pieces, um, Camelia Butti and uh, Megan Toll will join us and they are located in uh, Prince George and Kelowna. And we want to introduce you to them because they're new to our engagement team. So we look forward to having them join us later in the session. Uh, as we uh, move into this process, um, we have a couple of things that we want to share with you. We've got a quick poll just in case um, any of you want to participate in the process. So we're going to launch this poll and it's just going to ask you a couple of questions that you can feel free to answer uh, or not. It's just a fun thing to be able to do. So um, I'm just going to ask the team to launch the poll. And then I uh, wanted you to know about the Facebook chats uh, process as well while the poll is being launched that um, we will take the questions that you ask in the Facebook Live session and we will answer them either on screen or we'll answer them live through the, through the session. Uh, and so with that, are, are we having trouble with the poll folks? I, I don't see it, is it launched? Yep, the poll is active and we've got some folks jumping in. Oh, perfect, wonderful, I just can't see it. I'm, I'm looking at four different things on, on three different screens, everybody. So if I keep moving my head around, it's, it's not because I'm distracted. So um, maybe we can report some of the results of the poll there because I can't see the results. So whoever is able to see them, can you just jump in and let us know? Yeah, so, so far, um, we've got a whole bunch of people that have jumped in. We've got one person who is who's responded with, what on earth is BC's Office of the Human Rights Commissioner and what do they do? Uh, we've got three who have heard about Kasari and want to hear more from her. Uh, five who human rights are their thing and they want to be a part of these kinds of conversations. And awesome. nine who want to understand how human rights connect with Indigenous communities. Wonderful. 
So we hope we're going to spend some time on those answering those questions in the session in the future. Uh, before we begin, we've got a really short video to share with you about human rights. So it kind of sets the stage for what human rights are, and it's about three minutes long. And when we come back after that, we will jump into our discussion. So you can watch the video or you can go get your tea and get ready for our conversation together. All right, and I think we will load the video now. We come in all shapes and sizes from different backgrounds and beliefs. Whether you know exactly who you are or you're just starting your journey, at your core, you're a human being. You exist in the world. And simply by existing, you're entitled to certain basic rights, your human rights. These are the same rights that every other human has. Your child, your neighbor, a refugee, a farmer, we all get these rights at birth, without exception. Because human rights don't have to be earned, they are yours, regardless of who you are or what you've done. They exist at three basic levels, international, constitutional, and statutory. You may have heard of the right to education, the right to food, or the right to housing. These are international human rights. They apply to every single person around the world, and they are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You also have rights that are specific to Canada. These are protected by our Constitution in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. They include the right to vote, the right to equality, and freedom of expression. These rights all dictate how governments should treat people. But there's a third level, Statutory, the laws that dictate how people should treat each other in certain situations. Unless there's a justifiable reason, these laws protect you from discrimination by other people or organizations. For example, if you're looking for a washroom, there should be one you feel safe using. If you're trying to get medical help, you should be able to make it inside of the doctor's office. If you're interviewing for a job, you shouldn't be rejected because you're pregnant. And if you're looking to rent a home, you shouldn't be turned down because of your race. If you live anywhere on the lands now known as British Columbia, your rights are protected by the BC Human Rights Code. This code is a shield. It's a tool to seek help and justice. It protects you in the areas of employment, housing, and services like stores and restaurants. This means people like your landlord, your boss, or your server can't discriminate against you based on certain characteristics or grounds. Things like gender expression, ability, family status, age, religion, the list goes on. The code is here to support you because you have rights. We all do. And we also have responsibilities to respect the rights of others, to recognize discrimination, to speak out against injustice, and together to preserve dignity, respect, and the beauty of the human experience. So that's a video that uh, we made to introduce human rights to the to the province. Uh, we made it and launched it on International Human Rights Day in December last year. We're, we're very happy with it. And um, um, uh, I wanted to check in with our elders. I don't know if you've seen it before uh, and wondered if you had any comments about the video. Go ahead, Barb. Over to you, Uncle Shane. We'll take turns. OK, thank you. That was really wonderful. Uh, most excellent. It reflects the great Coast Salish word, Natsama. We, we are one. When I was thinking about today in human rights, Natsama, we are one as human beings with Mother Earth and with all other living beings. So when I watched that, I was excited about it and grateful because what it addresses 
is our oneness as human beings that we've drifted away from. And we're slowly coming back to that now. So kudos to you. Wonderful, entertaining, eye-catching, simple, very beautiful. Thank you, Shane. So I, I, at this point, we want to start to begin our conversation with the commissioner. And I want to mention that as we move into this part, we're going to talk about human rights in general. However, because of the colonization that has happened to Indigenous peoples, that sometimes just talking about human rights and discrimination can bring up um, real feelings uh, around things that have happened in the past. So it might bring up negative emotions for you. And we want to acknowledge that. Um, we want to note that the reason that we're doing this work is so that we can deal with some of the discrimination that's been happening in the province. So we would like to, to offer you the opportunity that if you're feeling um, triggered by anything that we're speaking about, please take care of yourself. Please take time to, um, to step away from the session if you need to, you know, go get some water or tea if you were um, able to, to get some tea together for yourself. Uh, please do take care of yourself. You don't have to hang in in the conversation that is creating further distress for you. Uh, and I also want to let you know that a protection that we've put in place is that we have got our team in the background of this session going on. And they will be looking for comments that are negative because one of the things that comes up when we have anti-racism and discrimination and human rights chats is that we get people coming out and saying negative things in our comments. And so I wanna ask you all out in the public to hold our team um, and hold their spirit because they are being faced with these comments as they come in all, all the time. And so we're asking them to, to protect you from seeing those. And hopefully we can work as a whole team to protect each other in this process. So right now, I just wanna open the session to the commissioner and to the, and to elders, to the elders, Barb and Shane, um, to begin our discussion about human rights. And I, I know that Barb was gonna start off with a question for you, Kasari, and your mic is, your, your, your mic is still muted. So you may wanna one mute now. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everyone. So um, after watching that video, it, it certainly uh, gave us a little bit of information, um, but uh, provided that opportunity um, to be curious, but at the same time uh, to uh, come together um, during this period of time uh, in a good way uh, with humility and with respect and, uh, and also that uh, Kasseri may not have the answer to each and every question as well, and uh, to honor that as well. And so um, given the focus of our conversation today, uh, the question that I would like to ask uh, everyone that uh, they can certainly uh, uh, respond back and forth is uh, to Kasseri, uh, what exactly are human rights? And what does that look like in British Columbia specifically? And is that different from the human rights for the rest of Canada? Thanks, Barb. Um, and thank you both Barb and Shane for starting us off uh, in such a good way. Um, I am also uh, in the same territory as Sharon. I'm on the unceded and traditional homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, uh, but I know we have uh, presence across the province here, both in our, our team and also uh, those joining us. So I really appreciate the, the welcomes uh, from, from both of you. Um, and Barb, I, I love the way you started us out with curiosity. I have uh, just behind my screens, I have a window uh, looking out in the park and, and uh, in big words on my window, I have a hanging that says, be curious. Um, so curiosity is a, an important value to me. So I really appreciate uh, starting out that way. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to answer the question about what human rights are, and it's, um, it's, it's great to have the invitation as well for others to participate. If I have to say it in a really short way, I would say at its heart, human, uh, human rights are about human dignity. Um, and uh, there's something uh, at our core, I think, uh, that is 
fundamental to respect about being human. It doesn't mean, in my view, that only humans have rights. Uh, but what we're here today to talk about is, is that human aspect and how we respect each other's fundamental human dignity. Um, to me, what's at the, the, the core right of human rights is really equality. And by that, I don't mean that we're all the same um, by any means, uh, but that we need to respect each other's differences, in fact. And that's really what equality is, is that understanding that difference isn't a disadvantage. Um, that we can respect each other's differences, and that's actually what makes us a more equal society. Um, so in a big, broad concept, that's what I think human rights is about. In more specifically, in this province, there is a human rights code, a piece of law that protects human rights and also creates the human rights uh, office of the human rights commissioner, or at least my role as the human rights commissioner. Um, and that is different in each province. Each province has its own human rights laws. Um, there's also a Canadian human rights code that deals with federal actors like banks and um, air, airlines and things like that. Um, but, and then there's the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which deals with a whole other set of human rights. But the human rights code here in BC is important because it sets up what does equality mean in some of the basic areas of our lives, like employment in um, in services, so if you go into a store and someone discriminates against you in these everyday interactions, how, how, wh what do we do about that? How do we, how do we, what are the obligations to respect each other and what do we do if, if our oblig, if our rights are violated? So it sets up a complaint mechanism process for that. Um, unfortunately, Indigenous people have often been excluded from that complaint process and that's a key priority for us and I know for other actors in the human rights system as well. As I say, I could keep going on this question. <laughs> she, she really can. Well, um. it's, it's, it's such a broad, um, broad area, but uh, um, something that is so critical to um, the well-being of each and every citizen in our province. So thank you. Thanks, Barb. And I, I'm wondering, Shane, I know that you had a few questions as well. If you wanted to jump in. Yes. My, my question is this. How did the esteemed lady become <laughs> interested in human rights? What was the interest? What, what grabbed you? Um, I, it's, it's been a passion of mine, uh, I'd like to say from day one. Um, I certainly as, as far as I'm conscious of, uh, because I was raised in an environment where human rights were, were central um, to my family's and my community's understanding of the world. So uh, my father's side of my family, my father was raised in, uh, in South Africa, and my father's side of the family is Indian and so grew up uh, under the apartheid regime and uh, really, um, you know, one of the most racist uh, regimes uh, that the modern world has seen. Um, and uh, many people in my family were very active in resisting uh, apartheid and working against it. And so um, that was a very significant uh, factor in my understanding of racism and how racism can operate and why anti-racism matters so much. Um, and then my, uh, my mother also comes from a long line of social activists and she spent her career working on gender-based violence issues and family violence issues and violence against children as well. And so I uh, grew up with lots of conversation around feminism and why that matters and uh, ro what role that plays in our lives. So it really was kind of the air I, I breathed uh, and that we, my sister and I uh, really grew up in that environment. So this job was a, a dream, dream come true. I've spent my career working um, almost entirely in constitutional work all around equality cases. Almost everything, um, I've had the great privilege of being able to work almost entirely on what does equality mean in the law and how do we protect it and how do we make law and actually a meaningful tool in people's lives? Like how do we create change, real change, not just change on the books, uh, but change that actually matters in people's lives. So uh, this job uh, working on in human rights in the province is just, as I say, being kind of a dream come true. So Kasari, given that, um, that you studied uh, constitutional law and you did work in, in gender-based violence, um, I'm just wondering, uh, since we didn't have a commission for about 17 years in BC, um, 
I'm wondering how you understood the role of what a commissioner does and, and um, how that's different from what a commissioner actually does as you've started to build the office in the last, what, year and a half? Um, well, well, one of the things is that um, there's a little bit of a fiction in the way this office is set up and that it's set up around one person, one role, but in fact is, is a growing and vibrant team of people. Um, all working on human rights. Um, and so part of the process of the last year and a half has been hiring that uh, amazing team of people. Um, and a lot of energy has gone into that and to bringing on uh, passionate uh, folks who are all gonna spend their diverse skills from education to research, to law lawyers, to communication specialists, all putting uh, their energy into this work. Um, and I have used this analogy with our team, I think, um, I've really had this visual of what we've been doing, uh, which from really this this office has been words on paper um, in in September 2019 when I started this role, they, it was just a few pages of a document in the human rights code, you know, some sections of the human rights code and it, that said things like inquiry and, uh, you know, you have these powers and and so on. And it's been breathing life into those words to what is what is this creature that we're creating that's rising from the page. Um, this body and what can they again, what can this body do uh, to create real change in people's lives. So that's still a, that's still a project that we're working on is breathing life into this work. Um, and understanding where are our big leverage points, what laws and policies can we really push to change. How do we create a new culture of human rights in the province um, through engaging with people through having these kinds of conversations through building education projects to help people better understand um, their rights and responsibilities and so on. Wow. Um, so I know that uh, as with, with everyone, Kasari, we've got very diverse uh, skills and wear many, many hats. And I understand one of those hats that, that you've worn as, is as a lawyer, and I'm assuming you still are. Um, and that you also were involved in the um, Missing and Murdered Women's Commission. Uh, that's something that's of huge interest to me uh, as a, uh, a survivor of domestic violence and as an Indigenous women, woman, pardon me, where, uh, you know, those, uh, those different acts of violence in all forms is, uh, is very prevalent uh, for Indigenous women and girls across this province. So, could you just tell us a little bit about that work um, and share with us uh, just your thoughts about that and, uh, you know, and just your thoughts maybe about the work as it's moving forward as well. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Barb. I, I know you are an expert in wearing many hats, as we heard from your introduction. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I, I did indeed I spend a fair amount of my time before I started this work working on issues around uh, violence against women more generally, and also specifically the rights of Indigenous women. Um, and that started actually before my time um, at, at West Coast Leaf, which was my previous organization. But uh, I started uh, when I was a, a, a baby lawyer, a junior lawyer, um, and I worked on, on some of the, the big cases that uh, dealt with uh, status issues for Indigenous women and uh, the, the Bill C-31 uh, women as they came to be known and marrying out and, and seeking to get access back to their communities um, after the operation of colonial laws, which kicked them out of their uh, the member Indian status and also banned membership and so on. Um, and while I was at West Coast Leaf, I, I did have the uh, opportunity to work on the Missing Women Inquiry by representing West Coast Leaf in, that, in those proceedings. Um, and it really was um, kind of an incredible opportunity actually to see how the inquiry operated because it, um, while it was by no means perfect, it uh, incorporated um, ceremony and uh, was thought outside the box in terms of a colonial pro a legal process. And I think that was part of the power certainly of the, of the inquiry as a whole, but also being able to participate in it and witness what was happening there is the power of, of that. In, in calling people in um, and creating powerful recommendations and, and trying to make change on these important issues, as you've pointed out, Barb. Um, I do unfortunately think that it hasn't, the recommendations haven't uh, gotten implemented in quite the way that many would want them to be. 
Um, I do hear though, I hear it still talked about quite a bit in uh, maybe I can say the halls of power. Uh, I think those in power still recognize that this is an important document. So it hasn't, it's, no, it's not yet uh, uh, put up on a dusty shelf somewhere, uh, but I don't think the actions are moving as fast as we'd want. And one of the areas that I, that um, at West Coast Leaf, that our submissions focused on, on child protection and the changes that needed to happen in the child protection system as one of the, the pathways um, uh, towards violence, if I can say it that way. One of the root causes is the abuse that children face within the child protection system and how that makes them more vulnerable to violence throughout their, their lives. The girls who experience sexual violence early are much more likely to experience uh, violence later in their lives and how the state participates in creating a system um, that is so dangerous uh, for so many Indigenous young people. Um, and that's an issue that I think uh, many are working hard on, including the representative for children and youth in, in her role as well. Uh, lots more to say again on that, but I think that's a bit of a, a, a few of my thoughts, at least, on, on this area. Thank you. Uh, I know that Shane has another question, but I wanted to jump in and ask you, because sorry, about any learnings you had from the inquiry process with the murdering, missing and murdered women's inquiry, and if there's anything that you would bring from that to the inquiries that the that our office will be able to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as part actually before the the national inquiry, there was of course the provincial Picton inquiry, and so I was involved in that process as well. And um, I'm not sure if anybody here was intimately involved in that process, but many of the organizations that had the ability to get involved all pulled out of the inquiry process together because there wasn't resources to support the participation, uh, particularly those organizations most directly representing and supporting Indigenous women. Um, and so there was sort of this, this exodus in protest of that process. And as a result of that, um, along with a number, a couple of other folks, um, coincidentally, uh, the, the current attorney general, um, but at the time he was the executive director of BC Civil Liberties, and there were a couple of people from Pivot Legal Society, and we got together and, and wrote a report um, called Blueprint for an Inquiry, and it tried to think, uh, how could this process have gone better? There were lots of, of people much more directly involved in the issues who were advocating and, and pushing for change and substance. Uh, they wanted to bring evidence to the court. They wanted to support women to bring their testimony. But we were, we were just trying to provide some of the legal structure uh, that we could think differently about how inquiries work. Um, you know, that inquiry was very painful in the sense that um, so many people were excluded from that process and Indigenous women stood outside the doors of that building drumming on Granville, uh, Granville Street, Granville in Georgia, and you could hear it up in the hearing room as this very Western colonial kind of legal process happened that looked much like a court. Um, and, uh, and they were out downstairs excluded and drumming. And so I think that was a very poignant example of how the process was not inclusive. So we wrote this report called Blueprint for an Inquiry. I think it ended up being uh, uh, fairly influential in the national process of being much more inclusive. And I learned a lot from that. And I think we have staff that have brought a lot of learnings as well. Of how, we don't have to create public inquiries that are so exclusionary and so colonial. It doesn't have to look like a court. Uh, we don't have to have the same understanding so exactly of how evidence works. We need to be fair. Uh, absolutely to all the parties involved. We need to create processes in which everybody can be heard, but that everybody being heard means thinking, thinking differently about how we can collect evidence and hear people's voices. And so we're very much building that into our first inquiry work in our office as well. Thanks for that. That's, that's um, really important for Indigenous people to be involved in, in inquiry, that it doesn't always have to look like an inquiry. Yeah. Over to you, Shane. As you know, Indigenous people across Canada are in a unique situation where we are legislated wards of the federal government. My question is this. And it's, it's based on the ping pong game that the federal government and the provincial government play with us. Although we're wards of the federal government, we live in a province. 
British Columbia constantly says to us, you're not in our jurisdiction, you belong to the feds. The feds constantly say to us, oh, sorry, we can't help you live in British Columbia. And that's a provincial issue. Go back to the province, province says, no, no, no. Sorry, Indians can't help you, you gotta go to the feds because you're a ward. So my question is this, are indigenous people in British Columbia under the federal human rights? Um, great question. And, and as your question reveals, it's not a completely simple answer. Um, but in many ways, um, the answer is the Indigenous people are governed by the provincial statute, so the, the, the human, BC's Human Rights Code. Um, and it's uh, important to note that, you know, most, most Indigenous people in BC live off of reserve. Um, and that is, uh, that means that their, their interactions gain in the, in the scope of the Human Rights Code, what the Human Rights co Code covers, Covers, covers those folks as well. So employment situations um, in uh, um, services that are usually available to the public, whether that's actually public services like government services or all the way to gain, like walking into a store um, and also housing and tenancy. It doesn't apply if the, the duty bearer, the one who is providing the housing, for example, is within federal jurisdiction. So if it's a band providing housing, that would be within federal jurisdiction. So there is some complexity for sure, but there is a, a lot of relevance to, of the human rights code to indigenous people in BC. Um, and that also means that as the human rights commissioner who's governed by the human rights code, my role is created by the human rights code. I also, this, this office and my role have relevance for indigenous people, uh, particularly people living off reserve, but also people living on reserve. And we've taken a fairly expansive approach to that. Um, and we've got a, a number of, of strategic priorities as an organization um, and key among them is decolonization. So it's very much uh, squarely as a focus for our work is addressing indigenous rights um, and also engaging in decolonizing work more generally. So thinking about how we do this work as well as what we're doing, uh, what kind of work we're producing. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> Now, I, I know that um, Shane has a further question about decolonization. Maybe it makes sense to, to bring it up here since you brought it up, Kasari. Shane, how do you feel? I'm sorry. What did you say? I, I was just saying that I know that you had another question around decolonization. And since Kasari brought it up, it makes sense that um, we jump into that one. It's one of those wonderful ongoing questions <laughs> for Indigenous people. We constantly hear elected leaderships talk about this is what we're doing in terms of decolonizing. One of the funnier words that I, I hear is the word settler. Settler is a nice word, but we didn't create it as Indigenous people. It's how the perpetrator uh, describes themselves in a nice way, when really what they are, are occupiers. Where I am today is unseated. So that means being unseated, it means that we're occupied by others. So decolonization, how are you as a leader of an organization, how are you addressing decolonizing your organization? Such an important question, Shane. Um, thank you for that. I, it, 
As with all these questions, uh, there's a long answer and a shorter answer. So I'll, I'll stick to some of uh, some of the highlights. Um, I, I just briefly mentioned in my last answer where we are thinking of decolonizing as both um, the how and the what of, of what we do, meaning we're trying to do some specific pieces of work or advocacy or projects that are, are decolonizing in nature. And then we're also trying to do our work in a different way. Um, so maybe I'll give a couple of examples of that. Um, I do maybe before I get into the examples, I'll say that we have uh, both the privilege and the burden of starting this organization from scratch, as I mentioned. And that means that we can build, we can try to build decolonizing in from the foundations. Um, and also means that we're gonna get things wrong. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that we are working hard on these issues. Uh, we are deeply committed to it and we know we're going to get things wrong as we go. And we are uh, committed to acknowledging that and trying to fix things as we go as well. Um, in terms of the, the how, uh, how we work, we um, in, the, in the fall put out a report on disaggregated data collection. Um, it's called the grandmother perspective. And we really built that work uh, around a framework that was gifted to us by Gwen Phillips, uh, the First Nations Data Governance Champion, who was a key informant for us in doing that work. And she talked about the importance of collecting data. And we're talking about the kind of data that identifies, you know, percentages of, of based on race and based on gender and so on. And so that we can better understand how our laws, policies, practices, issues in our society disproportionately impact different people so that we can create better laws and, and policies. So that's that's the kind of data we're talking about. And she talked about collecting it not from a big brother perspective, so government collecting it just for the sake of collecting it or just for the sake of monitoring its citizens, but pushing government to collect information from the perspective of a grandmother who needs that kind of information in order to, to, to care for her community and for her family. Um, and so that we, we tried to take a very different approach to why you would do this kind of data and how you would collect it um, and, and tried to outline a very different process from, again, from a decolonizing perspective. So that's an example of doing our work differently, I hope, the how part. Um, one, of the, one of the what examples, like what kind of projects are we working on, um, is that uh, we are uh, pushing for changes in the human rights code. So the human rights code prohibits discrimination on the basis of race and ethnicity, but it doesn't name indigeneity or indigenous identity as um, a prohibited ground of discrimination. And by prohibited ground of discrimination, I mean, it doesn't say explicitly discriminating against indigenous people because they're ind indigenous is illegal. It doesn't say that. Now it does say, discriminating against, against people because of their race is illegal. But um, Ardeth Wacom, now Justice Wacom, uh, wrote a report for the Human Rights Tribunal um, uh, last January, January before this last one, uh, about why so we know there's such huge issues faced by Indigenous people in the province, human rights issues, but very few people bringing those complaints to the Human Rights Tribunal. And one of the suggestions she makes for change is to name Indigeneity in the Human Rights Code to explicitly say you can't discriminate against an indigenous person because they're indigenous when they are your employee or when they are your tenant or, and so on. So we've been pushing for that change um, alongside uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and the BC Human Rights Tribunal and others, um, but really uh, advocating for that change to the Human Rights Code as part of our decolonizing efforts. And part of ensuring that the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the act that, in, that incorporates that in BC is actually implemented because it says you have to change your laws to make sure that it's in line with UNDRIP. Well, that's one of the ways the Human Rights Code needs to change to ensure it's in line with UNDRIP. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. So this is the, um, Kasari, the first time I've heard about the grandmother perspective and um, just in terms of, of context for, for me, when I think of that, being as I am a grandmother uh, and uh, 
to 18 grandchildren. So I'm, I'm getting pretty good at being a grandmother as well, I think. Um, but when I think about from a grandmother's perspective, especially through um, an Indigenous lens, um, I think of grandmothers being um, the holders and the caretakers of our knowledge, uh, being the holders and the caretakers of our medicine through language and connection to the land and, and uh, you know, in, in the way that um, Historically, we've raised up our children and we've passed on um, those teachings uh, so that, you know, it, and I think of that as a very decolonized kind of a, of a process. So I'm just wondering how, how will that grandmother's perspective be incorporated into, you know, you talk about data collection, et cetera, which is a very colonial um, kind of, of a process, um, how will we make that uh, truly relevant in the context? How will you make that relevant in the context of that grandmother lens? And, uh, you know, and if, if I can to um, just consider your own grandmother uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about that, because again, it's, it's kind of the marrying of the two, the decolonized uh, lens of that grandmother's perspective, along with the colonized lens of data collection and, you know, those contractual obligations, I guess, if you will, um, just how will that look? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I very much keep uh, your your invitation to consider my own grandmother close to my heart and, and my mother, who's uh, a grandmother as well. Um, and grandmothers have played an extremely important role in my life, so I hold that uh, very dear on a, a personal level. Um, but I, but I appreciate also how it, how that echoes through this analysis, um, not just on my on the personal level. And I think what what we're trying to suggest here is that data collection doesn't have to be a colonial instrument. It can be thought of as knowledge keeping um, and using that knowledge uh, for care. Um, for example, we uh, thought through some of the privacy considerations and uh, what that might mean um, for individuals, <coughs> excuse me, and um, realized that in order to think that through from a decolonizing perspective, we needed to think not only of privacy of the individual, but privacy or harm that could come to a community of disclosing information simply for the sake of disclosing information because we're following some process. So placing community and a government's relationship with community at the heart of this process, uh, not collecting information again for the sake of collecting it, but always collecting only if it's going to further the aims of substantive equality or, or real equality and uh, social change. Um, so we've suggested a legislative framework to the government that, that makes that explicit, that builds that into the legislation and says, you, you should only be able to collect this data if you've identified there's a social change goal here, an equality or human rights goal, and you have to have this data in order to reach that goal. And you don't know that until you talk to community. So we've suggested a structure that where First Nations involved, it would be nation to nation, agreements. Outside of the First Nations context, it may be based more on a community governance model. And that governance, that community governance uh, system is um, places as much control and empowerment as possible with community. So that the process is guided by community as much as possible. Um, really to decide is do we need this data in the first place? How do we collect it, store it, use it, disclose it in a way that doesn't cause harm or doesn't further harm to us, to the people as part of our community or our community as a whole? How do we do that in a way that actually furthers against these aims about human rights and equality? And I'm pleased to say that, um, that the recommendations that we made uh, showed up uh, in, in a rough form, at least, in the mandate letters for both the Attorney General and the new Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives in Government. So um, uh, for those in the audience who may not know that mandate letters are a letter that's given to a, a new member of government, a new uh, parliamentary secretary or a minister, 
to say, here's your, here's your marching orders, kind of this is what we want you to do over the time that you are in this role. And so both the Attorney General and this, uh, the Parliamentary Secretary have in there work with the Human Rights Commissioner to uh, create a structure for data, essentially, according to the, the advice that they've provided. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to continue to push forward um, this, this model of, of understanding knowledge and data through the grandmother lens. So really thinking about though that information, those stories from people um, and having a sacred responsibility for, for, those, for those stories. Uh, that's, that's kind of what I, I think of uh, as you've, you've uh, talked about this, Kasari. So thank you for, um, yeah, because I'm, I'm very interested in that concept. Thank you for that. Thank you. One of my takeaways from the grandmother perspective is that it can really inform all of the work that we do. We, if we start from a position of care, and then we, we know that through the healing movement for Indigenous communities, women and grandmothers really held this um, healing process over the last 20 to 30 years. So we have a lot to learn from the way that they took over and, and cared for people in communities. Um, and uh, in our organization, it's something that we are holding dear um, in the way that we approach our work. Um, this conversation has gone so quickly. If Shane's got his hand and he's ready to go and I wanted to get to the questions, but, but um, Shane, please go ahead and um, we'll see if we can get to a couple of questions after this. Okay. <clears throat> when Barb was speaking, one, one of the words that I've been getting everyone to change, and it's a slow process, but it, it's a change that needs to happen. And that's the word story. When I worked for the Indian Residential School Survivor Society, the lawyers for the government and the churches would constantly say, oh, this is their story. And right away the judge would discount probably three quarters of what's being said because he heard from the lawyer the word story. For the grandmother, my suggestion to the esteemed lady is to, in terms of decolonizing, because stories a colonizer word, is to use the word history or truth when gathering information. We, we don't have stories, Indigenous people. We have history with Canada and the province of inequity and we need to change that. So I just wanted to say that to everyone who's listening out there at this moment, that we need to change that word it needs to be history. The murdered women and girls, that's history. It's not a story. I know that when I'm out and about in the public and that's being spoken about, it's discounted because everybody says, Oh, yeah, the story about the uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women. So it becomes a story and it's not, it's not real to them. So we need to change the word, please, to history and truth as best you can. That's just a suggestion from a great grandfather <laughs> looking towards seven generations of healing. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. So adding the great grandfather perspective to the grandmother perspective. Um, we're actually, we have four minutes. I'm gonna ask Camelia and Megan to just jump in really quickly and maybe ask one question that you have seen trending from the comments that have come up. So we've got Megan and there's Camelia. Hello everyone. We, we, I know we don't have a lot of time. I, I did, was just gonna quickly say we were worried we wouldn't have any questions. And now we have so many questions and so little time. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you so much for your engagement on that chat. Um, it's really, really amazing to see. And quickly, just very quickly, I wanna acknowledge that when we're having these conversations, some feelings do come up um, and we just wanna hold space for any of those feelings that are bubbling up around the topics that we're talking about. Um, and just 
throw back to what Sharon said earlier about ensuring that we take care of ourselves and folks are taking care of themselves uh, leaving this conversation today. So I'll quickly throw to Camelia to pull a question from our busy chat. Great, thanks, Megan. That's definitely hard because we've had lots of really good questions. I am seeing a couple themes, so I think I'll uh, maybe combine a question from Kelly um, and from Carl Michonne. Hi, Carl. Um, it's surrounding the United Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People. So how specifically will the Commission be involved in the implementation of the Declaration when it comes to those questions on infringement on indigeneity? Um, thank you for the for the question. Um, there's uh, some of that, some of the specifics there are still being worked out um, exactly what role we will play. Certainly, we are um, taking, uh, uh, taking our responsibility to both implement UNDRIP um, in our organization as a, as a public organization insofar as it will help us identify our priorities, help put uh, more a finer point on what decolonization might mean for us um, and uh, help us understand the content of Indigenous rights um, because it, it does provide, um, it, it fills in uh, a lot of content uh, for us. Just uh, very briefly, the Declaration Act um, in BC, what it does is it adopts UNDRIP, uh, the UN Declaration, um, and also and says government has to put together an action plan um, and to just for the sake of clarity, we are not government. Uh, we are an oversight body. We are independent from government. So we don't, we're not the ones putting together the action plan. That's government's responsibility. And we are certainly um, keeping a close eye uh, to, to uh, make sure that happens, but also to support the First Nations leadership that is very active in working with government on what that looks like and to take our cues uh, from First Nations leadership on these issues. Um, specifically, I can give you a couple of examples of how this is showing up. So I said it, it gives us a sense of what our, some of our obligations are. It uh, spurs us to in our oversight role over government. And it also provides, I think, some concrete changes to the human rights code. Because what the Declaration Act says, in addition to saying we adopt UNDRIP, we, we want to, um, uh, put together this action plan we're committing to doing this that's what government's saying it's also saying it's bringing it's will bring all of its laws into compliance with undrip over time and one of those laws uh certainly the one that's closest to our hearts is the human rights code so i talked about introducing the new ground around indigeneity pushing we've made a strong recommendation to government to do that we've also made a recommendation to government to include a prohibition of discrimination on the basis of poverty or social condition. So again, what that means is uh, right now, it, there is nothing in law that says you can't discriminate against someone because they're poor or they look poor. If someone walks into a store and gets kicked out because they say, we don't want your kind in here uh, because they look homeless, that is illegal right now. It is not legal to do that on the basis of someone's race or someone's gender or disability, but it is legal to do that on, on the basis of poverty or homelessness. And we think it's part of the UNDRIP uh, responsibility because Indigenous people, because of the impact of, decolon of colonization, Indigenous people are overrepresented among those living in poverty. So in order for an Indigenous person living in poverty who experiences discrimination to get their to get justice, they have to right now fit within the human rights code, which excludes both of those areas of their experience. And so we're saying this is important under UNDRIP. UNDRIP recognizes social condition. It says government has an, states have an obligation to address people's social and economic condition without discrimination. And so we're saying these kinds of considerations need to be explicitly based in the human rights code to give people remedies, to give them opportunities to seek justice when they're discriminated against on these because of these reasons. Thank you so much, Kasari. Unfortunately, we're out of time and I want to just extend um, thanks on behalf of the entire office to all of you who attended our session here today. And I wanna also thank grandmother Barb and great grandfather Shane for being here with us today and for your amazing questions and and um, grilling the commissioner a little bit. Um, we hope to have more of these sessions in the future with elders from around the province. 
um, so that we keep up the conversation so that you can keep asking questions and um, holding us accountable for the role that we have in ensuring that Indigenous people's rights, human rights are um, being upheld in BC. So thank you all and thank you to our wonderful team, Megan and Camelia and Emily and Diana and Jocelyn who are in the background helping us to put this all on. We look forward to seeing you in the future and we'll let you know, we'll give you more advanced notice uh, for the next session that we hold. Thank you very much and have a wonderful, lovely day. Thank you everyone.